Foi o Falcão e Cunha. Muito bom dia. Não sei se me estão a ouvir. Ah, então, sim. Estão a ouvir, professor? Estou a ouvir. Não sei se me estão a ouvir. Estamos sim, professor. Estamos sim. Eu, o meu computador... My computer crashed and I couldn't connect through the iPhone, but I think it's okay now. I can, I, at least I can, uh, I can see you and I can hear you. Can you see and hear me? Yes. Oh, that's yes. perfect. <laughs> okay. So I think we can start. Sure. João, do you want to start? Um, yes, I will. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm here with Professor Falcão in Cunha and Professor Rick van der Waal. And uh, uh, Professor Falcão in Cunha is our dean. He will make the opening uh, words for this uh, Cong doctoral congress in engineering of FEUP. Uh, and uh, followed by the keynote uh, speech by Professor Rick van der Waal, uh, uh, who is the rector of the University of Ghent and president of CESAIR. Professor Falco in Cunha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, please, uh, you, you, are, you have the word now. Well, good morning, everyone, in particular, uh, the rector and the president of CESAIR. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, event. Uh, and uh, I'd like also to thank my colleague, João Pedro Pego, uh, who shares with me the first name, which is a very difficult name to pronounce uh, in other languages. But uh, uh, I'd like to thank him and his team for organizing this event uh, in these uh, uh, conditions. And I really hope it will be the last time this uh, event happens online so we can meet each other and uh, discuss all the ideas. Um, this is an event with a, a long tradition now. Uh, it's very important for our, our uh, doctoral uh, candidates and not only for our can, uh, doctoral candidates but to, for whoever participates actively uh, in this uh, uh, event. Um, I would like also to say uh, that uh, we are uh, in the, the School of Engineering is part of the University of Porto, which is a, a very uh, large university for Portuguese standards and uh, covers many areas, in particular science technology, uh, which is the case of our uh, faculty. The, the most important thing uh, if, of these events is, of course, sharing the knowledge and the experiences we have. But even more important is to learn, to learn new ideas, to, know, to learn new concepts, new experiences. And uh, so this new knowledge that we are able to uh, uh, get contact with can influence our work and influence our work, not by just by, set by itself, but in a way that we can change for better the society by the results we uh, work on. So I really hope that uh, during these few days, during these hours, uh, you will remember something important that you've listened or that something in your mind becomes aware of something important that can benefit your work and benefit society. And of course, uh, the sponsors. Uh, I hope the sponsors will also be involved and will benefit from being part of this event. So, uh, I would like to thank all of you for being here and I just wish you that you'll be able to know Porto, if you're not in Porto, 
and know, uh, get to visit us uh, and get to work together with some of us. So thank you very much and enjoy these uh, few uh, days. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Falco and Cunha, for your kind words. And um, I'll now introduce Professor Rick van der Waal. He is the rector of the University of Ghent in Belgium. And uh, I, we invited him as, um, uh, in, as his role as, as uh, president of CESAIR. CESAIR is a network of uh, uh, schools of engineering that uh, has um, been uh, making a lot of work into making lives of engineers uh, better, for the better. So, Professor Rick Van der Waal, it is a pleasure and a honor to have you with us. And we will like, uh, we are very keen to hear uh, your lecture on three ways to look at European research area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joao. Can you hear me, Joao? Yes, perfectly. Yes. So, dear colleagues, dear uh, Joao, thank you um, very much, actually, for inviting me uh, to this uh, doctoral congress in engineering or the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Porto, um, speaking uh, about the European research area, usually abbreviated as uh, ERA, um, is, as you will uh, see, very uh, important and very timely um, as well. So, yes, I will uh, talk about three ways of looking at the uh, European research area, the ERA. Now, um, today, I, of course, I speak to you as, as engineers, I speak to you as scientists, and I speak to you as potential future university leaders as well. And being an engineer myself, the uh, ERA is of particular importance uh, to us from, from Ghent University to our community of over 53 research intensive universities uh, of science and technology united within CESAR as a, as, a, as a university network and indeed to me personally um, as well. And since the uh, establishment of our association, CESAR, this was back in 1990, uh, we have committed and we have contributed to the advancement of the uh, era and since 2013, even as a so-called era stakeholder organization. I will come back to that later in this, uh, in this talk. Now, to bring the uh, European research area closer to you today, I will offer you basically three ways of looking at it. First, I will touch upon the, the current political initiative from the European Union called after a document uh, with the title, A New Era for Research and Innovation. So I will look at the era from a political uh, perspective, if you want. Secondly, I will go back in time and I will reflect on the inclusion of the era um, as, the, as the free circulation of researchers, scientific knowledge and technology into the treaty of the functioning of the uh, European Union, uh, meaning that I will look at it from a EU constitutional perspective. And thirdly, I will go even more back in time and I will recall the role of research, of education and innovation since basically since the end of World War II uh, in assuring that we never have war nor hunger again in uh, Europe. So I will look at it from a societal perspective um, as well. And we will share, by the way, this presentation with the, with the organizers for, for distribution to you, uh, and please note the links in the, in the presentation, they are underlined, and you can, you can click on them to, uh, to see more information. Now let us first look at the uh, um, era from a political um, perspective. Um, the European Union, in less than a year, has launched this political initiative named after a communication from the European Commission called a new era for research and innovation, which was in fact quickly uh, followed by conclusions of the Council of the EU. And that means by research ministers of the EU member states. Now, I encourage you to read both documents as they will have concrete and tangible impact impact on you as early stage researchers. Um, the Council and the Commission now 
work on what they call a pact for research and innovation in Europe. And they are outlining, uh, first of all, some, some principles and secondly, some priorities as well for the coming um, years. And, and then this will be followed by the development of national era action plans, which uh, stakeholder organizations, such as universities and, and, and researchers, such as you, uh, amongst others, are expected to, to implement. Uh, now, so far, so good, uh, you could say. But looking at the steps uh, on the left side of the slide, you will find that the Council is ex expected to adopt a what I call a recommendation later this year as opposed to the earlier conclusions. Uh, and quite frankly, this is the point where I, as an engineer, as a rector, and, and also as president of university association uh, called Cesar, uh, this is the point where I need advice from experts in European affairs in my university and from Cesar to explain to me such legal nuances and, and to translate this terminology used in such um, document. And from this analysis and, and following discussions within Cesar and with other era uh, stakeholder organizations, differences emerged between the Council and Commission on, on the one side and some era stakeholder organizations on the other side. And, and these differences concern three, three things. First of all, the level of ambition of this initiative. Uh, think of truly realizing earlier commitments concerning the funding levels for research and innovation in Europe. Secondly, the legally binding nature of it. Think of the commitments of national governments to effectively remove legal barriers and obstacles to the free circulation of researchers in areas such as uh, pensions, uh, social security, and, and even migration. And thirdly, the engagement of uh, era stakeholder organizations such as Cesar in this initiative, um, noting that we have committed and contributed since 30 years already. And, and to better understand these differences between the state on the one side and academia, on the other, and to find ways to resolve them, we need to look from, from different um, perspectives. Um, so let us therefore now look at the inclusion of the era in the what is called the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. Um, that is to say, from a, from a broader and a EU constitutional um, perspective. Now, from a constitutional perspective, what ends up in legislation such as the one establishing the EU framework programs for research and innovation, the current 10th edition is called Horizon Europe, as you know, reflects the status quo of European integration. There is a status quo. Uh, before looking at the era in the uh, EU treaties, with this slide, I would like to highlight that the European integration in the field of EU funding for research and innovation has occurred over a much longer period than the current political initiative I, I just presented. In fact, uh, in fact, research and uh, technological development, uh, RTD in short, were included in the very first predecessor of the EU called the European Community for Steel and Coal back in 1951 already. And moreover, uh, from this slide, you can see that since then, major other EU funding programs for research and innovation emerged, such as the framework programs in uh, 1984 and Eureka in 1985. And I, I reckon um, many of you carry out your research activities and develop new technologies co-funded by such EU programs, and therefore you are aware that this entails complex and, and far-reaching uh, managerial, administrative, legal, and financial implications. And that is why research-based universities, such as the University of Porto and such as Ghent University as well, have highly specialized and professional staff supporting you in this matter. Now, finally, and importantly, uh, you can also see that it took until 1986 before research became a, a formal community policy objective under the Single European Act from, from 1986, a basis 
for European industry and, and an encouragement actually to industry to become more competitive at the international level. But you and I, as researchers, very well know that academia does not work exclusively for the sake of business and industry. There's more to what we do. Uh, and that is why the debate over European integration and research continued after the 1980s uh, with an important and even what I would call a, a game-changing moment for European academics, academic institutions and academia as a whole, the year 2007. So following the establishment of various community programs for RTD, uh, Rolf Darendorf already in the, in the 1970s actually initiated the thinking around European integration and research policy and others followed him in the decades thereafter. But from the very beginning, there were major discussions and, and divisions that needed to be resolved. One of the most important division, divisions was and, and somehow still is between those who aim at integrating the diverse and, and diverging national science and technology systems into what you could call a single area for European science. And for the sake of the argument, let us call them the Federalists, believing in an, in an ever closer union. Uh, and secondly, we have those who insisted uh, on coordination, coordination amongst the national science systems in the member states themselves. Let us call them confederalists, believing in, in national uh, sovereignty and subsidiarity between the EU and its uh, member states. Now, the Belgian commissioner, Philippe Busquin, in, back in 2000, revived and, and intensified such debates uh, with his uh, successors, publishing uh, consecutive communications on the era, in, in uh, 2008, 2012, and the one in 2020 that I presented uh, to you earlier. Arguably, the inclusion in the Lisbon Treaty in uh, 2007 of, first of all, the era in which researchers, scientific knowledge and technology circulate freely, and secondly, the European uh, Union institutions establishing measures for the implementation of this era along the, the ordinary legislative procedure was to finally bring in also the Federalists' view into the EU treaties. And this is indeed the game-changing moment that I mentioned earlier, 2007. And rather unsurprisingly, the, uh, the member states in 2012 walked away. They walked away from the negotiations on the implementation of the era with the Commission and the era stakeholder organizations such as CESAR. And although the era stakeholders and their members were very committed and put a lot of efforts, the successes were limited without active contributions of the member states. And by 27, uh, 2016, the uh, era had largely disappeared from the European agenda until the Council revived it in 2018. It called upon the Commission to come forward with a, with a proposal for the renewed era, which resulted in the one I presented to you um, before. In fact, part of the differences between, uh, of, or part of the differences concerning the era as the, the current uh, political initiative is exactly about the true nature and geographic scope of the era. Is its achievement, one, a next step in European integration, paving the way for more free, more competitive, more collaborative and easier science and technology in, in entire Europe and even beyond? Or is the era, second, a compilation of now 27 diverse and divergent national uh, science and technology systems. Such discussions to us academics might come across uh, a little bit bewildering as we feel that science and technology are truly international or even better global undertakings steered by peer review and under the assumption of self-regulation of academia along scientific integrity, academic freedom, and 
institutional autonomy of universities. And this is exactly why we need to take yet another third perspective to understand. even better the relevance of the era for scientists such as you um, and I. And the third perspective on the era departs from the Europe of the Middle Ages, without nation states, wherein researchers and also artists, by the way, uh, and knowledge in principle circulated freely. In the Middle Ages, science, Researchers, artists, they circulated freely, limited only uh, by, for example, wars or pandemics. And if you look at it from this perspective, science and technology some, somehow, and education in Europe in particular, since the 17th century, were put under the control of states. And subsequently, as of the late 18th and, and the early 19th uh, century, they nationalized. And you all, you, you all, of course, are aware of the grave consequence, uh, the grave consequences of these two processes for academics, academic institutions, science and technology systems, and arguably the entire global s and system with the epicenter of academia moving from, from basically from Germany to the United States of America after the Second World War. But Recalling uh, Robert Oppenheimer, we as a scientist, and we as, as engineers in particular, actually, we may never ever forget the devastating consequences that our scientific knowledge and our technologies had on societies all over the globe. So the modern origins of the era lie in the, in the, uh, the, 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 the resurrection of European research and innovation from the ashes, actually, of World War II. Now, against this, this dramatic backdrop, we need to seek the, uh, the origins of the era in the establishment of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg in, uh, in 1949, inspired by the autonomous position of academia in the, in the American and British, uh, British uh, societies this organization, as of its establishment, already added a European dimension in education. It defended academic freedom and helped academics and academic institutions in many countries in Europe, including Portugal, to liberate themselves from oppression by and submission to autocratic states and political parties. And the Council of Europe was crucial, was really crucial, in empowering academic cooperation across borders and the, and the Iron Curtain to build the, the, the bridges between conflicts, cultures and countries, paving the way for economic and political cooperation. And after its fall in uh, 1989, the integration of new member states from Eastern Europe into the European Union. And as you can see from the slide, the endeavors originating in the Council of Europe in 1949 were taken up by the EU in the course of the following decades, notably also through the Erasmus program in 1987, and more recently, the, uh, the so-called European universities. And this per perspective attributes to academics and academic institutions a, a very important, a very strong, but also a very important social responsibility to teach democratic citizenship, citizens, uh, citizenship to our students and to advance the uh, European identity with the next generations to help ensuring that we never have war nor hunger again in, um, in Europe. And at the heart of our uh, societal responsibility lie basically two sets of values. First, we must safeguard scientific integrity, academic freedom and institutional autonomy. Dear colleagues, that is why I really advise you, and I even ask you to read, to understand, and to live the principles laid down in what is called the Magna Carta Universitatum. Secondly, we must promote 
sustainable peace and prosperity, incorporating respect for rule of law and human rights, democratic citizenship, evidence-based policy making, and free circulation of knowledge. These are arguably rather universal, uh, universal than European values, but we here in Europe, given our history and given our role worldwide, in my view, we have a special responsibility in this respect, and we need to seek like-minded partners to promote compliance with the U uh, Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights. It is an illusion to think that we have achieved both sets of values within the EU once and for all. If you read the news, you will, sadly enough, find striking examples of interferences on both sets of values also within the EU member states. Actually, I was not going to refer to, uh, to the European Championship, uh, uh, the soccer uh, Champions League, because, because we won. I'm from Belgium, you know, because we won. But the example of Hungary is too alarming not to be mentioned here. Promoting equality, promoting diversity, promoting inclusion is key. Now, the changed geopolitical context, the changed expectations to academia, the, the emerging uh, key technologies and digitalization urge us all to come into action and to defend these values everywhere in Europe and beyond. Dear colleagues, um, it is exactly from this uh, societal perspective that major achievements such as the ones shown here uh, were established structurally, changing science and technology in Europe. We have CERN since 1954 uh, to make sure that the scientific knowledge from particle physics and nuclear technologies would not destroy our planet. We have the uh, Marie Slod uh, Slodowska uh, Curie um, uh, instrument since uh, 1996 to boost the careers of early stage researchers such as you when crossing borders and, and to work together with colleagues from, from business and, and industry. We have the ERC since uh, 2007 to provide grants for investigator-driven frontier, uh, frontier research selected solely on the basis of scientific excellence. We have the EIC since this year, actually, to, to support disruptive innovations and to scale them up globally and so on and so forth. And on the right side, on the right side of this slide, you see that the EU back in 2003 acknowledged the unique position of research intensive universities. They cover the entire knowledge uh, triangle of uh, research, education, and innovation within knowledge based societies as opposed to industrial or post industrial societies. And this acknowledgement led to far reaching competencies for universities which since then can autonomously negotiate the managerial, the financial and legal aspects of consortia under the framework programs. I mentioned earlier uh, that these uh, framework programs are really, uh, are really important. And the autonomy of universities is important um, as well. It also paved the way for era stakeholders such as Cesar to step forward and to assume their responsibility to, to contribute to achieving the era together with all partners. Uh, and by the way, your country, Portugal, and our fellow engineer, Mariano Gago, played a major role in the societal design of the current competitiveness uh, paradigm uh, through, the, uh, through, through the Arabida uh, meetings. All this resulted in the so-called Lisbon Agenda, as agreed upon by the European Council in 2000, to create jobs and to boost economic growth along the knowledge triangle between states, business and industry, and academia. And more recently, the citizens uh, themselves, you and I, were added to this so-called triple helix. Universities of science, of science and technology thereby operate at the forefront, and they demonstrate extensive and elaborate experience in the cooperation with industry and with businesses and with, with governments um, alike. But we all are, of course, aware of the tremendous local uh, and global challenges, such as the current COVID-19 pandemic and the ones that loom behind it. 
uh, think of uh, climate change, think of biodiversity laws, think of plastic pollution, and so on and so forth. And when, when speaking about the era from the societal perspective, we as academics and engineers, we must reflect. We must reflect about a human-made world. We must reflect about the values and the ethical frameworks needed. We must reflect about the enlargement and the broadening of our collaborations to other partners, such as NGOs, artistic organizations, and so on and so forth. And in essence, we academics and academic institutions, we need to become and act as agents of the great changes of, and, and, and the great transformations needed to help tackling these tremendous local and global challenges. Um, and it is from this societal perspective where we as scientists and we as, engineer, as engineers, we, we can engage in a, in a fruitful dialogue uh, about the rationale and the objectives of European policies for research, education, and innovation, and the design of the corresponding EU funding instruments, instruments that help achieving the era. Because it matters to you, and it matters to me as scientists as, and, and as engineers, whether you get a grant selected solely on the basis of scientific excellence or on the expected impact as articulated by industry via the commission. And, and in this slide, you see some of the design considerations for the uh, EU policies and, and funding programs. And I could elaborate uh, for each of them for, for many hours, actually, uh, how, how the choice for one or the other will have impact on us and, 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 and on our knowledge-based um, uh, societies. But in essence, the choices made along such uh, considerations will greatly determine who will benefit from our scientific results and technologies. Will it be a local politician expecting immediate impact to win the next election? Will it be a large cooperation expecting incremental innovation to maximize profits? Will it be the poor and disadvantaged because you offer your science and technology as a global public good? Will it be humankind as a whole because you broaden your problem definitions and methods and work together with colleagues from the social sciences and humanities? Will it be planet Earth because you succeed to transmit your solutions to local challenges to the global level along systems thinking and systems engineering approaches? These are the main questions you have to, to ask yourself. We have to ask ourselves. Dear colleagues, um, these choices, and I will, I will, I will, I will end uh, shortly, these choices will provide the answers on, on imminent questions for you, for your careers, for your colleagues, for your family and friends. Here you see some, some, some questions listed. Uh, what topics and technologies can I work on and under what conditions? Engineers typically work on key emerging technologies that allow for dual use, are subject to foreign interference, and touch upon the uh, EU strategic assets and, and autonomy. The questions raised here on this slide are obviously not exhaustive, uh, and I am not going to read them all out um, to you, but there is one uh, which is particularly important to me as director of Ghent University and president of CESAR, which is the following one. Will publishing in open journals, open access journals, have a negative impact on my scientific career, yes or no? The answer to this question depends on many aspects, such as, does the leadership of your university modernize its research assessment system away from publishing in high impact journals towards a culture of quality, a culture of trust, a culture of risk taking? This is something we have to do as rectors. We have to think about that question. My, my answer to, to this question is yes, I do this. I want to do this. I do this at my own university, which is Gantt University. Second question, does the funder of your grant go along with this and allows or even demands such publishing. This is the job of the commission or national research councils. Third question, does the competent, uh, competent regional and national authority allow universities to determine their own career frameworks? This is the job of regional governments and the EU member states. 
Is the publishing industry ready and willing to switch business models, which is the job of business and industry? Does a not-for-profit organization, such as the European Open Science Cloud Association, provide for the framework in which you can store and process the corresponding scientific data and make available along, along the FAIR principles, FAIR standing for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. This is a job for an NGO. And are you ready and are you willing as an individual researcher to dare going open access? This is a job you have to do. You have to ask yourself this, uh, this question. I'm hoping for a positive answer, but it's up to you to, uh, to ask this question to yourself and to act upon it. Now, the second example very well summarizes that, that, that achieving the era looked at from any of the three perspectives I presented to you today involves a, a, a broad area uh, of societal players, including us, scientists, engineers, and um, university um, leaders. Uh, I guess I, I, what I try to do with, the, with this presentation is, is to tell you basically one thing. The era concretely affects you as a young scientist and as a young engineer. And that is why I encourage you to assume your social responsibility and to help achieving the era and shaping knowledge-based societies for a sustainable future in, in Europe and, and beyond. Uh, obviously, you will find us from, from Ghent University and from Cesar standing very strongly um, by, by your side. Uh, dear colleagues, dear young researchers, uh, dare to think, dare to hope for a bright uh, um, future. Thank you very much for your um, attention. Dear Professor Rick van der Waal, it was a nice, fantastic talk, uh, thought-provoking, uh, to be very honest, and I'm, I'm very happy that we had you here. And uh, I don't know if Professor Jean Falcon would like to address uh, a couple of uh, issues, and we have a couple of questions, and we have still 10 minutes to answer if... if, if Uh, can in, instead of raising your hand, can people put the questions on the questions and, and, and answers, please? And while I don't see them, I'll ask Professor. Um, well, I'll I'll make a question while people think about that. You, you were saying uh, about the directors taking the risk about uh, possible uh, change to the standard publication. Uh, rules, let's say, what kind of uh, risks are you taking uh, in this matter? Because I believe we have to take risks, as you said. Yes. Uh, well, actually, at, at Ghent University, uh, uh, two to three years ago, we started with a, with, a, with a very ambitious exercise. Basically, what we do at our university, uh, when we are evaluating um, professors and principal investigators, we do not count any more. And I will repeat that. We do not count any more. What we do basically is we ask our professors, we ask our principal uh, investigators when they are to be evaluated, what are you proud of? What did you do the last couple of years? What is, what is it that you want us to know that we need to know in order to be able to evaluate you? And of course, some of them say, look, I published in, 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 in very high, high quality journals and, and others say, I, I, I managed to, to get a lot of uh, European Union funding. But some of them also say, look, I took time. I took time to reflect, to change my path. I, I changed my, my field of expertise. I wrote a book. It takes, it takes some time. Uh, still other ones, they say, 
I started uh, high-risk research programs. Um, and I, I, I really don't know whether I will obtain any results. But it's an, it's an interesting scientific question. And I, I, I ask myself this question, and I want an answer to that question. And that's why I, 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 I took the time to formulate a question, to find a way to, 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 to get an answer to this question. And now I'm trying to solve the, to, to, to provide an answer to the, to the question. So this level of freedom is something we, we, we drastically, even some of them said dramatically, injected into our career models. And it works well. The risk we, 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 which is related to that is that uh, if you don't count anymore, some people say, look, if you don't count publications, nobody will, will publish. If you don't ca count the number of PhD degrees, nobody will, will try to attract PhD students. We, we don't see any of this. What we do see, uh, however, is uh, professors and principal investigators with a lot of freedom, and they dare to take a risk themselves in their research uh, uh, paths and in, in, in their research uh, programs. And I, I really believe this, this, this kind of freedom, this type of freedom is, is crucial in academia. And, and, and this is why we, we, we did this. Um, quite, quite a lot of universities in, in the Netherlands, for example, are, are, as we speak, are doing the same thing. And I really think, um, Joao, that we, we, we have to, to be uh, advocates of this, uh, this vision. Um, academia should be given back to researchers. Uh, and it should be about much more than just counting, counting numbers. OK, thank you very much. And congratulations on Belgium. And uh, good, you. Luck, <laughs> good luck with Italy. <laughs> Uh, we have here a couple of questions from Professor Armina Alves. She says, could you give us the perspective of She says, could you give us the perspective Cesar regarding the precarity of research careers? So from scholarship oh, yeah. to scholarship. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, actually, we, we published, uh, I, I, can, I can send them to you. Uh, we published some, some documents, some, some statements, uh, which were very firm statements, I, I, actually. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to, to young researchers uh, within, uh, within um, Cesar. Uh, at quite a lot of universities, the situation of young researchers is as follows. They, they start their research career, they, 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 they get a contract. Most of the times, it's a, it's a rather short time. Uh, contract after six months or, or, or one month, the contract is, is renewed and so on and so forth. We, we want to have more stability in the, in the system. When you start as a PhD student, you should be sure, there should be some, some kind of guarantee that there will be funding for you to be able to, 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 to finalize your, your, your PhD, which does not mean that if you as a PhD student, you're doing nothing, that you can stay on board, of course there will be evaluation and there need to be, e e e there need to be e uh, evaluations, but if everything goes well and if your research is, is progressing in, an, in a more or less expected way, you should be assured that the, the, there is funding until you obtain your, your PhD um, degree. Does this mean that I am stating or that Cesar is stating that everyone who obtains a PhD degree should become a professor. No, it doesn't mean that. And I think this is also something we, 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 should, we should state more. Uh, and also I, as, as rector of Ghent University, maybe I, 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 should, I should put more effort in this. The, the, the end goal of obtaining a PhD should not be only to become a professor. The majority of, uh, uh, of the researchers that obtain the PhD should leave the university. They shouldn't necessarily leave research and development or science and technology, but they should leave the university. They should, they should be active in society. They should, they should be going to, 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 to companies, to research institutions uh, apart from, from, from universities. 
So there's a, there's a tension sometimes between um, the expectations that um, young researchers have, and these expectations sometimes are, look, I started uh, as a PhD student, I did a PhD, my PhD was great, the, the examination committee told me that I'm a genius, uh, this is the best PhD they ever saw, and all of a sudden, there's no position as a professor at, at my university. The latter does not need to be a, prom a, a, prom a problem uh, 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 per se, because we should convince young, young researchers who have obtained a PhD to, I mean, to travel, to go away, to go to, to, go to other places, other universities, other institutions, uh, the industry, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is this is how I see it, both as director of Ghent University and as as president of uh, of Cesar. Thank you very much. I have one last question because we don't have time for much more, but uh, it's a related matter from uh, Katya, and she say in recent years in Portugal there's been an effort to uh, replace postdoctoral fellowships by temporary contracts which are a better situation but not perfect. In terms of European efforts, is there any rules being employed to stimulate researchers to pursue the academic career? So you already mentioned this, but is there anything else you want to add? No, uh, actually not. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe just one, one, one thing. Um, the, the end result, so to speak, of a PhD uh, journey should not only be the PhD degree. It should only also be um, confidence. When you obtain a PhD degree, especially when you obtain uh, a PhD in engineering at a, at a very high quality university as, as yours, University of Porto, you sh this proves, it really proves that you can do a lot, um, and this proves that it is it is it is okay to be ambitious, and it also proves that you are able to 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 meet these uh, ambitions. Um, and and sometimes I think we as promoters, as deans, as as department heads, as rectors, um, sometimes we 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 are focusing too much on the degree itself. And not not enough on on what it stands for. Obtaining a degree, a PhD degree in engineering at a high quality university means a lot. It's a proof, uh, and, and it should be the start of a of of, of broadening your 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 world, your your vision, uh, your interests as a as an individual. Okay, and then. Just 30 seconds question uh, from Professor Varum is a nice question. In your university, what are the mechanisms you are adopting to encourage the link between research activities and industry and society? And now this will be our last question. Please, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, we, we have quite a lot of professors who are setting up collaboration with the industry. Um, uh, at the uh, government uh, level, we have, we have actually very good instruments which are based on uh, co-funding uh, mechanisms, meaning that, for example, the industry pays 50% of the bills and, and, and the government uh, uh, adds on top of that uh, the other 50% of the money. Uh, next to that, we have what we call strategic research organizations, um, and they basically work along the same principles. Uh, you can set up uh, research pro projects under the umbrella of these uh, strategic research uh, uh, centers. Uh, and in terms of uh, funding, it is the industry, uh, the, in the industrial partners, they have to pay for themselves. And, but if they do so, then we as, uh, as, as, uh, as universities, we get the money, uh, the corresponding money actually, from these uh, strategic research uh, centers. And these strategic research centers we have one in, in biotech, we have one in uh, uh, information um, of technology, we have one uh, in what is called uh, the, the make uh, in, uh, industry, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, if I may add just one comment, the, uh, the risk related to that type of funding is, is the following. Um, you have to avoid that all your research activities 
are somehow focused on a very limited number of, of, of research fields, uh, namely the ones in which industries and, and, and business uh, actors are interested. Uh, Ghent University is a comprehensive university. It is very important for us as a university, and it's also important for, for us as engineers to be linked not only with engineers and not only with, 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 with uh, companies, uh, the fact that we are a comprehensive uh, university is a very important asset. Um, so uh, the instruments I just described are very important. They are really important. But we should not forget that also uh, social sciences and humanities, for example, are, are important uh, as well, for which the industry will never pay. But the government uh, needs to pay for that type of research. And we as universities, we, 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 we should pay for that uh, type of research as well. So we, we need a mix of, 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 of many fields. Um, if you look at the global, the global challenges, uh, they are not just engineering challenges. Um, um, there, are, uh, there are much more things that need to be um, investigated in order than, than just engineering in order to be able to solve these, uh, uh, these problems. Thank you very much, Professor Val Cunha. Cunha, I think we can stop here. Professor Rick van der Waal, it was really a pleasure and a honor to have you here. It was uh, very uh, thought-provoking and uh, I really enjoyed and uh, I hope to see you soon in an in-person event uh, nearby. Okay, thank you very much. Professor Val Cunha, if you'd like to take a final words. Just thanking uh, Professor Rick van der Waal for his uh, very interesting talk and answers and i wish you a good day and uh, hope you will be able to have a very good position at the end of the european cap <laughs> i think we will, we will win <laughs> thank you very yeah. much it was a pleasure to be here bye, -bye. thank you very much thank you very bye -bye. much you. Bye, bye 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 Guy, everybody, we will now go to the session. Um, I'm going to a backstage, Professor Rick Vanneval. <laughs>